Well, guys, it is time for Get Ignited. Tonight, this evening, this afternoon in Colorado, is the launch of our fall season of Get Ignited Conversations. And we are so lucky today to have a very special guest, Kylie Burse. Now, those of you who are calling in from Colorado, you know Kylie to be the meteorologist at Nine News in Denver. She's an anchor. She has her own show called The Feed, which explores all things food in Colorado, which I'm sure was really exciting pre-COVID and probably very interesting now. Um, food is still very important right now, right? She also hosts the Unpretentious Theater Review. Notice, unpretentious, really important word when we talk about Kylie. Unpretentious Theater Review, which is lighthearted and straightforward reviews. And it's interesting how she actually came to cover that and what it means to her. And she has quite a theater background. Okay, and more recently, a hiking blog called The Approachable Outdoors. Are they, is it The Approachable Adventurer or The Approachable Outdoors, Kylie? <laughs> the Approachable Outdoors. Which I love, which is really kind of fun. We're going to hit on that because Kylie's in Colorado, after all, where everyone is so athletic, so active, so cool. And Kylie brings sort of this very unpretentious, approachable angle to that where she's so real and makes fun of herself going camping with not only half a tent or yeah. what do you think? <laughs> Welcome, Kylie. We're so happy to have you here today. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited. This is really fun. Well, we're really glad you're here. And it's we had so much fun talking before the call, and I'm so excited for you to get to know Kylie if you don't already. So one of the things we're going to talk about, what I just am dying to talk about, is I, I was saying in the social media, Kylie is as dynamic as the Rocky Mountain weather she covers. So what in the world is going on with the Rocky Mountain weather? <laughs> oh, gosh. I mean, it's, it's been wild here. I think we've broken 14 records in the last, like, four or five days because we had record-breaking heat on Saturday and Sunday, and then we're talking like the hottest temperature ever recorded in September. It was 101 degrees, and then literally two days later, a massive cold front dropped in, and we had one of the earliest snows on record, which was just crazy. That was Tuesday into Wednesday, and then still today I called it our transition day, but we're going to be back to like sunshine and 80s by this weekend. Okay, now you actually sound like you're on the news right now. <laughs> You're, you're professional, you go pro, you know, you're pro. Now, on an admin level, I can't hear you as well as, I don't know if there's a way to make you, your volume a little bit louder, but I'm not sure that this is true. Sandy, you can tell me what you think on that. Mm. I want to make sure everybody can hear you. Um, and it might just be me. Okay. I'm not good to Zoom. <laughs> Fine. Our producer can hear just fine. Okay, so this is going on. So then what's going on with the wildfires? Uh, We've had a bad, bad couple of weeks. Luckily, these fires got started quite a bit later in the season, which is good because by the time we get to October, we got enough snow that puts them out. But I don't know if you guys saw yesterday in San Francisco. I mean, they had that orange glow. Yes. And it, I mean, they are dealing with one of the worst wildfire seasons that they've ever had. And when that smoke came in, it was just nearly impossible to see anything. The air quality was awful. It, the, it was so dark that it actually triggered the street lights there. So it's really, really sad. That is unbelievable what's going on. I mean, and you haven't had a dull moment. Um, so talk to us a little bit about, we're gonna get into how you got into it, but what about the psychology of weather? We know you needed to be a scientist, right? You're a scientist by training. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanna talk about how you got into it, but there's also a psychological aspect you talked about in terms of being a meteorologist. So tell us about that. Well, I think when it comes to forecasting, especially, and I did get, I got my degree from Mississippi State. So I actually went through the whole process, took all the classes, but there's something that like you do when it comes, or at least that I do when it comes to forecasting, because so often I think that like, have you guys ever heard people say like they're weather terrorists, like we make things, you know, we try and make things dramatic for ratings and I can promise you most of us meteorologists hate that as much as you do when it's like overblown. We're constantly going to producers who are typically the ones that are writing those really big headlines, you know, saying like, oh, this huge thing is happening. And we try and dial it back a little bit because when it comes to forecasting, there's something interesting because when you promise something, which you never do, but you put something out there as your forecast and you feel really confident about it, 
you want to make sure that you can deliver or at least meet the expectations of what people see. Because if you say, I'm very careful, you'll never hear me say the word tornado on TV unless it's like very much a possibility. Because that's the only thing that person's going to hear when they, when they walk away. So it's being very careful with the wording. And then specifically with snow, when it comes to forecasting snow, people only hear the highest number that you forecast. So if you say three to six, they hear six inches. And then in their mind, that's half a foot and that's a ton of snow. So let's say that I think it's going to be five inches. Let's, if you would think about like, okay, cool, you do a range around that like four to eight. I might err on the side of a little bit lower because if I think it's going to be five inches and we get six inches, people are pretty okay with that. They're like, oh, that delivered, it was even a little bit more. But if you say five inches and you get an inch, people are pissed. They're so angry. And so there's a little bit of psychology that'll go into it that I'll try and make sure that I'm not letting people get hung up on certain buzzwords. Well, first of all, I think it's like having a toddler in a way. Like if you say to a toddler, we're gonna get ice cream, and then you fail, you are, I mean, it's over, it's undone. So in a way it's like that, but then there's a part of it that's like gambling in a way, like you're, and you're dealing with weather, you're not in control of it. So yeah. what's that like, is it, are you a gambler? I know, is there an element of gambling in weather forecasting? I guess there is, which I'm not a gambler at all. I, I hate gambling, why would I ever possibly lose my money? The upside's not worth it for me. Um, I did have to become okay with being wrong sometimes. Typically when they, when they've taken the average of like our accuracy rate, it's about 85%, which is, pretty good when you're predicting the future because sometimes literally mother nature just throws you an absolute curveball and you're just like okay but what what I really like about my job and kind of the platform that I have is I had a really and it wasn't just every meteorologist in town and if you're in Colorado maybe you remember this it was like a year or two ago I think we forecasted two inches of snow right around there maybe like two to four inches and one strip got a foot of snow so like that's, that's a big mess up, like by anyone's standards, a foot of snow. So 10 inches more than what we forecasted. But what was crazy was I sat down and I went back and I looked back over all of the data. And then I talked with other meteorologists and we kind of looked at what happened and what ended up happening. So in Colorado, we have the mountains and they play a really big role. And so the wind, we call it upslope. So basically like if here's your mountain, sometimes the wind hits it and then rises. And what that does, almost like lake effect snow, if you've ever heard of that, it creates this kind of snow machine effect. And so you get the wind and it goes like this. But if the wind goes slightly a few degrees off and it doesn't quite hit it at that direct angle, it's fine. But what happened that day was the wind changed just a few degrees and it hit the mountains and the foothills in such a certain way. And then it just created this long path of a foot of snow within, I think, a couple of hours. It was incredible. And so I got to actually tell people, hey, I went, and I went back and looked. I was like, is, could, is there any inkling? Did I miss something? What did I miss? And if I were to go back and do that day all over again, I wouldn't forecast anything differently. I would still have said the, it would have been irresponsible. It was a freak of nature thing that the wind changed those few degrees and it just was perfect for that one little town. First of all, I don't know for anybody listening, but I have chills. I mean, I'm on the edge of my seat. I didn't know it could be so exciting what you're doing. And is, is it really tricky in Denver? You're in Denver. That must be a very challenging place to predict weather, is it? Yes. And so the Midwest is a lot of textbook meteorology. So that's what we learned about in school, those big mid-latitude cyclones that come through and they bring all of that, that rain, then snow. And you can, you can kind of follow that. In Denver, the terrain throws everything off. And we can also get like mountain wave clouds, which are when you get these kind of big old waves that are excuse me, these big old clouds that look like waves, they come over the mountains and then they can blow your forecast too. And so they, they just, they throw everything off. You can learn it, but they're always going to be like a little bit of a curveball. Okay. And so you're really having these extreme curveballs, like you're saying, and, they're and I'd love to hear if there's a particularly interesting one other than, but. Do people reach out when they're angry? What happens? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. There was one day where we literally sat and read like all the mean tweets and mean emails out loud that people sent us. I think like Jimmy Fallon or one of the late night hosts used to do that. People get so mad. And I think, I think we're an easy target. And yeah. like, 
a lot of it's like, oh, you get paid to be wrong half the time, or it didn't do this at my house. And what's so funny is most of the time when people are mad, the, they didn't hear it from us or they saw it somewhere else. And like our forecast was pretty accurate. Uh, but when, when it's wrong, we admit it. Like we're pretty good about that. And then we explain what happened and what went wrong. Like that day with the snowstorm, they let me go on air and say, this is exactly what happened. And people were like, oh, well, that makes sense. But yeah. Right, the people who are reasonable are let you up. <laughs> the other people are still holding you accountable. You've rained on their parade, I guess. It's like <laughs> exactly. it's incredible. Well, I just love that this is what you've done. It was hard for you to decide to go into it. Can you talk a little bit about how you went into yeah. this? So I actually really didn't want to go into it. In college, I was a journalism major and wanted to be a war correspondent or an anchor. And I filled in on weather on our sports show out at CU Boulder. And I did it just to get more on-air time. I just, I just knew that the, the only way you're going to get better is by getting more time on-air. So I was like, okay, well, I can, talk, I can do ski reports. And everyone kept saying, you should be a weather girl. You should be a weather girl. Well, when I was growing up, weather girls were bimbos. Like that was, it was the joke of, you know, like, oh, if you don't know anything, go and just tell people about the weather. Mm -hmm. And I hated that and I didn't want to be that. But uh, at the time I interned at KUSA in Denver where I am right now. And we have the most incredible chief meteorologist, Kathy Sabin. And I saw this, I mean, beautiful, gorgeous woman who was smart as hell. And she did all of her own forecasting and, you know, no, there's no script. Like when we get up there, we're one of the very few people at the station where we have no script whatsoever. There's no prompter or anything like that. And yeah. like, oh yeah, we just, we go on there and we have to talk about the forecast. You've got to know what your forecast is. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes people think, oh, someone's going to hand it to you. Uh, so when I decided, I got into my first job in Idaho Falls and started reporting and started covering those horrific, like, murders and I covered an execution. I covered one horrible day where three family members died going into an irrigation ditch. Like it was because they went in to go save one after the other and they got electrocuted. And I showed up with a camera and I'm standing in their driveway and I'm just like, like the ick factor. And there's a absolute place for it. And I respect all of my fellow friends and journalists that can do that because that story needed to be told. I just couldn't do it without absolutely breaking down. And so I started realizing, I don't really, this isn't me. And at the same time, I was doing some weather and I was like, okay, this is fun. And it's hard. It's challenging. Each day is different. I get to show up on air with a smile on my face and no one yells at me. That was my biggest complaint in the first market. My first job, when I was anchoring, I would read almost every story with a smile. So <laughs> Sounds funny until you're reading about like someone dying and you're smiling. And of course I understood why people were upset, but it didn't fit my personality. And so when I decided to do weather, I made a point. I was like, I'm going back to school and I'm going to learn as much as I can. And so I did three years online, part-time while working full-time, like in between forecasts and in between TV hits, I'm literally just like doing tests for school, like thermodynamics, learning about cloud physics, all of that. And so I never thought I was good at science growing up. And so when I was able to do it and do relatively well, it was this really cool moment of pride where I was like, I'm a scientist and that's awesome. I never thought I'd be a scientist. Well, I love that part about your story because I, how many young girls don't see themselves as scientists and, and how you really have embraced it and brought so much to it. And we count on, we live in, I live in the Midwest and it's life or death, right? Uh, weather with tornadoes, it's we need and we rely on our weather forecasters. And so you save lives, you really do. I mean, you know that. Um, if we listen to you, right? If we listen, you save lives. What's your degree called? Uh, I believe it's, it's either broadcast or operational meteorology. Okay. I can't remember which one, I, you could get either one. <laughs> they let you choose like the title of it. And what's the hardest course you had to take in your training? I think it was thermodynamics. I really struggled with that one because that was just like, it was so much math. And a lot of people, when they do it through a traditional like four year school and whatnot, and obviously Mississippi, Mississippi State is, but I didn't do it that way. A lot of people take all like calc one, two, up through like differential equations. So thermodynamics was really hard and a struggle, but that was kind of the fun part of it was, okay, I did something that I didn't think would, I would ever be good at doing. And it's really interesting. And part of Kylie's, 
uh, past is that she was also involved in theater as a young person. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But when you think about the interesting contrast, the Get Ignited show is part of the Ignite Method. The, the Ignite Method is about discovering and unleashing your genius so you can accomplish the extraordinary. The reason that this is important is we're always looking at who is somebody at their best? What are they doing? What's their unconscious competence? Something that they don't even know and see in themselves because it comes so naturally. And that's sort of what we're talking about. But I'm always interested in paradoxes, like somebody who's great in theater and also really good at science. Somebody, and you know, when you think about Kylie, she can see around corners. Okay, somebody who she actually is trained in forecasting, but she has a natural intuitive nature that enables her to look ahead and see around corners. And many people on the call have that too, that ability to anticipate what's coming. Now there's every strength is attached to weakness and every weakness is attached to a strength. It's something we uncover in the Ignite Method. The reason I mention it with you, Kylie, is you have this terrific strength of forecasting and anticipating and being strategic even. But more recently you've discovered and been sharing through your blog something that's more vulnerable to you. Can you talk a little bit about what you've been um, experiencing and sharing with your um, followers? Yeah, uh, so I have been talking a lot more about my mental health and my anxiety, which is still like, like my palms will start sweating right now because it still makes me anxious even talking about it. But I, I was probably diagnosed maybe three years ago. And then I've been, I had a, a one therapist when I was in Minneapolis and then I've had a great one here for probably about a year and a half. But it took until probably last fall to actually start talking about it. Because if I'm being completely honest, I was very embarrassed that I, I had this thing that I felt like was very wrong with me. Like, why, why couldn't I just operate like everyone else that, you know, I saw, like, at least from the outside. And so when I started sharing about it, because I was starting to talk to friends, and I was starting to realize that what I thought I saw on the outside, well, they were dealing with that on the inside, too. You know, those, like the racing mind and the constant questioning and, and working through it. Like we all were trying to better ourselves and find ways to manage our anxiety. And so when I started talking about it, it was pretty remarkable how many people ended up reaching out and saying like, I, I have this too. And I, and I think that's incredible. And then I, one of the ones that hit me the most was I had, I had a couple of parents reach out and say like, my kid has anxiety and I didn't understand and like, not that they understand fully now, but that they got a little bit of a glimpse into that mind. And so it's been terrifying. It's been amazing because I'm connecting with so many people, but every time um, I'll post something about it on Instagram and I literally have to like throw my phone and just like leave it for hours because I get so nervous about it. But then it's interesting with the blog, part of the reason why I wanted to talk about it and part of the reason why I called it, the approachable outdoors in general was because here in Colorado, we've got this, you know, this almost like outdoor elitist, it's, which is fair. We've got the best outdoors in possibly the world. Like we have some of the best stuff, but it became so much of like, oh, well, if you're not doing the 14 er you're not outdoorsy. Or like, it just became this intimidation thing. And for me, I'm not athletic whatsoever. Like I played one sport of a season of basketball and I scored one one basket the whole season. <laughs> like I'm not athletic, but going outside for me and going into the mountains and specifically like, especially when you get out of service, it was so good for my mental health. Like it became part of my therapy. And so why I wanted to start this blog was to talk about mental health and then also to break down those barriers for, and say like, yes, you can't get outside. Like you don't have to be this amazing Colorado and you know, that's running up down the hills, like just go outside, go for a walk that's so good for your mental health. And it's been really fun and really scary to share all that. Well, first of all, I wanna thank you for sharing. And one of the things that is unique about getting Ignited Conversations is I really wanna encourage people to chat in what you're noticing and seeing in Kylie that you admire, what you appreciate, because we cannot see ourselves without the help of others. And it's such a gift that Kylie's giving us to share with us today, and especially your areas of vulnerability. And so if anybody wants to share anything in the chat, I think it's really, will be helpful and, and for the group and wonderful. But thank you for sharing that. And I want people who are listening to notice how does it feel to have received that from Kylie. For me, it's so heartwarming because here you are, this woman who's so polished, so brilliant, so together and so successful. And then to let us in 
and just see a little bit of something that's real for you. No one would ever guess that you even ever have a moment of doubt, much less you have your mind racing with, um, you know, anxious thoughts. And, and so I just want to tell you that I don't know how you all feel receiving it. I see that Adrian Bracey wrote, thanks, Kylie, I can relate. And Adrian Bracey is on this call. She's one of the most extraordinary women I know. She's actually an Ignite coach. She's part of our coaching cohort, but she's leading the YWCA and um, has an incredible background. Um, three Super Bowl rings because of her work in the NFL. And she's really cool. And she just wrote, I can relate. Thanks, Kyla, I can relate. So this is something that's a common thread and an opportunity where you can really use your platform to share and help others. Have you received stories that have been really touching to you uh, from followers and readers, and viewers? Yeah, I mean, I think the one, that one parent one sticks out to me because I know that my parents don't understand anxiety, although I definitely see anxious traits in them. So I'm like, pretty sure I got this from you. But they, <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> and there's definitely a genetic component. All of us grandkids all have anxiety or something like that, but, but they don't understand it. And, and so when I heard from that parent who said like, my daughter's been going through like, like I think it was a teenager too specifically, because I remember being a teenager and thinking like, what on earth is wrong with me? I, I just feel like something's really wrong. And I wish then that I was able to get the help that I've had now for just learning kind of that coping. And it's so funny that you say like, I, I look polished and all this stuff and because I, I, don't, I don't feel that way whatsoever, but it is every time I have massive anxiety and I've done entire TV shows having full anxiety attacks. And I've had people reach out. It was one of our regular guests right after I shared, he's like, I had no idea you had anxiety. And I remember being like, Bruce, I literally was like, my whole body was shaking interviewing you one day. You didn't notice. And he had no idea which just like, it blows me away. Cause sometimes, sometimes I think with mental health, we almost wish people could see and know like, you know, like a rash or something like, okay, cool. You're having an anxious moment. Like I can help you, but it's this weird, like invisibility that people can't see, which is, which blows me away. Cause inside it feels like sometimes like you're dying. Well, I love what you just said in terms of the way you describe that. Wishing we could see, we have this recording. We need to, to capture that it's so well said. And what if we could see it and how much more compassion we can have for one another. But I also think it's interesting how highly effective you are and how anxiety is probably something that you're able to perform under tremendous amounts of pressure. And even with adrenaline and cortisol in your system, you're probably able to show up and be fully present to the moment. Like when, yeah, I, I, it's been, I, well, and it's funny because, so I went through a really tough breakup last year and there was a lot of anxiety around that and a lot of self-confidence issues. Uh, but there were times when I would, I would, I would either be like having a panic attack. I think I had one panic attack at 4.15 in the morning. We go on at 4.30 and I was looking in the mirror at my face and my eyes are puffy and I have, and I look terrified because panic attacks, if you ever had one, they're, they're awful. Um, but then 15 minutes later, some, somehow I was on TV and I remember it being like, and going through weather and I went through probably a month where I go on air and then I go sit, the nine news has this little backyard. I'd sit in the backyard and I'd cry in between hits. And then I would, I'd, they, my producer would go in my ear and be like 90 seconds away. So I go, I'd wipe my tears, I'd get on air and I'd do it. And I kept waiting for those viewer emails for someone, for someone to say, not a single person noticed. So it became this weird, I could, I could somehow still, thank God, perform my job, but it, it, it's crazy how you can be doing something outwardly, but inside be feeling such awful feelings. Which is why what you're doing, which is spreading your message and being honest is so important because think how many people are struggling. And then they can look at you and say, well, if she's admitting it, then I can too. I can admit it too. And then there's an opportunity. You're really involved in helping girls. Girls on the Run is really important to you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So for those who don't know, Girls on the Run is this incredible organization. Uh, based, I was a coach for three years in Minneapolis, and now I'm on the ambassador. The, uh, I'm on the ambassador. I'm on the associate board here. That's the word I'm looking for. I've been up since two o'clock in the morning. So sometimes we're not here. Okay. So what they do is it's amazing. So basically, it's like an after-school program, and it's a running program, but 
it's not a running program. Like, yes, we do laps and whatnot, but basically we just try and get into girls' heads as early as third grade of, you know, that empowerment. And, and also a lot of it's building other girls up, trying to break down that gossip cycle that kind of happens in a societal just as you're growing up and I think it gets perpetuated. And so just teaching them to have confidence and positivity and we, we train for a 5K and then we get to the 5K day and it's funny because every girl has a running buddy and as a coach, we were one of their running buddies. So basically someone who's with them this entire 5K and you might walk the whole thing. I've walked them, I've run them with the girls, but no matter what, you're gonna have someone there with you to cross the finish line. And seeing these girls' faces when they accomplish a 5K, which like for anyone, that's a big deal. Running three miles is a big deal. But for like a third grader to have, be like, no, I'm never going to be able to run that. And then to finish it and to have your whole team cheering you on. Uh, so that's my, that's one of my favorite organizations. And I'm so glad I get to be a part of it. But I also love, uh, I, I do a lot of school visits or I did, you know, pre-COVID, like so yeah. many. <laughs> uh, and I loved showing up in a dress and heels because I wanted these young girls to see you can be a scientist and wear heels. You can wear a dress. Like you don't have to look a certain way. And sometimes I'm in jeans or whatever, but I wanted them to see what I didn't see growing up because I thought as a scientist, you know, you couldn't be girly or it took away from your intelligence, which I think people try and do to us a lot as female meteorologists is they try and diminish you if you're dressed a certain way or you look a certain way. And of course you have to look professional but it's pretty wild what people feel free to comment on. Like uh, you and I were talking about it. Yeah. I received some incredible feedback. And when you were in your 20s, you said people would say all sorts of things. What, what might they say to you on air? I mean, about you on air. So they, they would write, these are people who are writing in. And yeah. they say these things now. I just have learned to somehow, most of the time, let them roll off my back. But... I mean, it's anything. It's you look too fat, you're too skinny. Uh, why would you wear? I, li I lived in a very conservative uh, area, religious wise, of Idaho. And so if I showed my shoulders, that was like someone wrote in and told me they weren't comfortable having their son in the room because I, I showed my shoulder ones. Uh, yeah. Specifically, not to turn to the side because my nose is too hideous. I've got a little like bump on my nose. So people are like, how dare she have a nose ring? And I'm like, it's just kind of part of it. So it, it's anything. And it, it happened, I mean, it happened a lot in your first market, but when you're 22, think about like how insecure you are in so many ways when you're 22. And then all of a sudden you go on TV and people are telling you that you're hideous or that, you know, this is, you know, one thing or the other. And it still happens. It's like, I still, I, I think it was a few, few months ago, right when COVID stopped and we got a ton, like people, I think we're just angry in general. Uh, telling me that I was flirting with the camera and that was inappropriate because I smiled too much, uh, that my hair was terrible and I should get a haircut. And I was like, it's COVID. Like, what do you want me to do? It was like in the beginning when you couldn't get your haircut. So it happens a lot. I just at some point had to kind of accept, okay, this is me. This is what I look like. I can't change my face. No, and it's funny. Somebody just wrote in, um, Gail, who's in Boulder, said, can you imagine male newscasters getting comments like that? <laughs> they do not get quite, they, they do get a few, but they do not get the same um, type of scrutiny. And I think too, for some reason, it's a lot of women who are messaging us. So these are a lot of times coming from women, which I don't think that, you know, that's what girls on the run we try and teach is, hey, let's not criticize. Hey, we women have to pay attention to that. We're hardest on each other. We really are. Yeah. It's a crazy phenomenon. Um, one of the things that seems like a theme in your life is that you're always breaking down barriers. Scientists can be women. Outdoorsy activities don't have to be elitist. I mean, you lived in Minneapolis before. That's also pretty elitist outdoors. <laughs> you run a 5K. Polished people can have anxiety. Has this always been a part of you? Breaking barriers? I had honestly never thought about it like that. I think that I just for so long would put myself in a box. Like, no, I don't want to be a weather girl. And then it was through like the encouragement of others that I just started saying like, kind of just, you know, screw it. Let's give it a try and, and, and see what happens. And I think the, I've always found the things I'm most afraid of doing in life have been the most rewarding. And so like, I was really scared to start that blog and I was really scared to talk about my mental health because that's kind of a scary thing. But 
I, I guess I just had never looked at it that way. That's interesting. Well, it's interesting to think about. And, and then this piece also about um, theater reviews don't have to be pretentious. So you love, I know there's not a lot of theater happening right now, unfortunately, but you love covering Broadway uh, oh. shows, right? Yeah. It's Talk like, a little bit about your unpretentious approach to um, reviews. Well, I, just, I think I approach a lot of things as to, well, how would I want to get this information? So like with my weather forecast, I want, I want the basics. What do I need to wear for the day? What do I need to prepare for it? And I just found whenever I read a theater review about a show, it was like the most hoity-toity, like, oh, the lighting at this point, the set didn't quite do this, and their pitch was off. And I was just like, I don't really, like, I even grew up in theater, and I don't care about that stuff. And so what I wanted, and I wanted to make, and I guess this is more of breaking down those barriers, I wanted the arts to become something that people felt like they could give a give a try. And so basically I got one of my best friends in town who also grew up in theater and we started this unpretentious theater review where basically it's, should you spend your money on this show? Because they are expensive. Is it worth your time? Should you bring your kids? What's something that we love? Who do we think won't enjoy this show? So that was, like, that's what I want to know. Is it worth my hard earned money to go and spend a whole night getting dressed up and going to the theater? Because some of the shows aren't worth it. And especially like some of them are for like date night. Some of them are bring your niece or nephew or your kids or whatever it is. And I just wanted people to feel like they could go to a show and you don't have to have this like stuffy attitude about it. Oh, I love that. Now, let me ask you, you were into theater. Were you uh, musical theater? Were you, what kind of, what did you do growing up? Gosh, I tried, but I can't sing or dance. So <laughs> it was a very short lived career in that way. I could act, uh, but I loved children's theater and and actually, I went, I got to college at CU and I double majored in theater for a while. And the one show that I did, I had to like, it was just a, the most depressing show. It was like, I had to like pretend to pop pills and the show ended with my neck in a noose. And I was like, this, this is not for me. Like, I don't think so. And so I ended up kind of saying like, okay, I can't sing or dance anyway. But yeah, I grew up in children's theater. Absolutely loved it. A lot of um, improv, which I actually credit to being a huge part of why I can now speak without a script. And do right, but like you can do the weather, no script, just show up and you've done your homework ahead of time on your forecast and just be present. And well, also, if you think about weather, talk about needing improv, right? It's changing constantly. Oh, yeah. It's, right. Especially in Colorado. It's just like everyone, everyone in, in the world says, wait five minutes and the weather changes. I've lived in, I think, like 10 states. And this is the one that I found that that's absolutely true. In. <laughs> and that is Right, and it's, it's Colorado's intense weather-wise. It's so exciting. And so are you. So I'm wondering right now, I met you through somebody who I love, Amy Chesterton, who's on this call, my sister-in-law. And Amy, if you're here, I'm wondering, I asked Amy if she would say anything or uh, comment, but she's written some comments in here, and I'm looking for Amy to show up. But you know what? She lost her electricity, so we're going to see if she shows up. She's because oh, here. Look at here. Okay, I just thought you might have a chance to say hi to Kylie. And if hi, there's a Kylie, it's so amazing to see you. It's so good to see you. Oh, I miss you so much. I miss Barbara. I miss you too. This has been so crazy. Well, you know what, Kylie? I knew you've outdone my expectations. And you have, there's so much depth and awesomeness to you. There always was, but it's been really fun to learn more about you. Thank you. Amy, what do you admire about Kylie? Well, I think it's, you know, one of the things I've always really loved about Kylie is, I mean, she's this gorgeous, really smart woman, and she's so kind, so kind. And I, I think that, you know, she seems pretty accomplished from my perspective. And just to have that calmness and that genuine kindness in every person she touches in a community is amazing. I didn't even know half the stuff she was into. I mean, I, I didn't even know that she was involved with Girls on the Run. Um, I haven't read her blog. I didn't know about anxiety. I mean, my gosh, what a terrible time. I mean, I think probably everyone has some sort of anxiety now. It's nuts. It's been a crazy time. But I think, Kylie, that you have so much to give. <laughs> you shouldn't feel obligated to give it. But I think you very freely give of your your natural traits and what you what you're comfortable with and I think it's a real gift for people. 
Thank you. And Amy, I do feel like I have to admit that I like have sworn at you under my breath multiple times when you used to teach bar method classes. So it wasn't all just kindness there. I dropped a few. I, it's okay to swear. I understand. <laughs> well, I think it's important also that you guys have seen each other at your best. You've seen each other at your worst mm -hmm. and you have a real relationship and you've seen, and you just so much admire Kylie and you made the introduction for me and for us. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate it. Um, Amy is also an Ignite coach, by the way. She's an Ignited person. She's a wellness curator. But what's interesting about Amy, and I think you would probably agree with this, because remember, guys, this is part of the Ignite method, which is about discovering and unleashing your genius so you can accomplish the extraordinary. Okay? Amy's thing that she can't see in herself, and she's beginning to, is that people show up for Amy. There's something about Amy that makes you want to do more, be more, and be your best self. So Amy, without even trying, it's effortless for Amy to be this way. It's just how she is and who she is. But it creates this. She thought people were coming to the bar method, which she owned in Boulder and ran and managed and led. And she thought they were coming just for the workout. But it ends up they also were coming because they love and respect Amy. So when the pandemic hit, they were all like, Amy, we love you. Where did you go? So it's interesting to kind of be a... Uh, fly on the wall with your relationship, Kylie, because I know how much Amy has meant to that community. Oh my gosh. Well, and so Amy, I hope you know, like, I used to have to drive 30 minutes to get to Bar Method in Boulder. And I mean, I loved every single instructor there, but like, there were a couple of days where it's like, is this worth the 30 minute drive? And like, your class was always the one. And I think because you have this incredible presence about you, that makes people feel like they can do something that maybe they thought that they couldn't, which if you guys have ever done a bar method class, like they're incredibly difficult, but they're doable. You just need to have that mindset. And you were so good at pushing me and I'm sure everyone else that was there to just go like a tiny bit farther. And I just loved it. And then even when the pandemic happened, I'd only watch your classes online. So like you have this really special gift of connecting with people and empowering them. Cause I always felt, I would always leave that class feeling so freaking good. So I hope you know that. Well, thank you. That's, that's really kind. But it is funny when you were talking about how you're not an athlete. I mean, you were, you performed so, you worked so hard in there always. So <laughs> I always thought, of course you're an athlete. Of course you're on your weekends climbing 14ers, I assumed. <laughs> I just, uh, I didn't want to, I didn't want to disappoint the beautiful instructors. <laughs> I get there and be like, okay, I'm going to do it. Well, it's really interesting. I also think if you'll notice, everybody in the audience noticed that Amy Chesterton, in a way, dismissed what Kylie just said about her as a compliment. And that's what we do. When people name what it is about you that's your genius, we often dismiss it as a compliment because we don't know how much it matters. But Amy, and we are humble. We appreciate humility, right? Isn't it great that Amy's humble? But the facts are, we need to take this in and we need to discover it about ourselves and take it in. And um, Amy, I think, really is taking it in. She's getting that because, um, but it's so powerful, feedback, and what we can do for one another. Amy, anything you're thinking since I just said that to you? Well, I'm feeling pretty strong. I don't know. Who's my <laughs> next crew? Who am I bossing up next? No. I know. And, and so we'll continue to talk more about this. Um, it's such important conversation to have for each of us about who are we at our best and what are we doing that comes so naturally so that we can do more of it? It's not because we want to brag. It's so that we can actually have more impact and more fun, more joy. Um, one of the things, Kylie, I want to ask for you, and then I want to see if anybody has any questions. I'm going to encourage people to, um, and I'd like to see if Parker's here. She's an Ignite ambassador. She's um, been helping us so much throughout the last year, and she's on this call, and I just want to see if Parker has anything to say. Before we go to you, Parker, I'm going to give you a minute to think. Kylie, as you, your sources of inspiration, as you put out different things into the world now, you're putting more of yourself, you're vulnerable, you're revealing parts of yourself. How is this, what inspires you now? And is it, is your inspiration changed at all? You know, I think I just really enjoy connecting with people. I love talking to people and having that connection. I actually had a really good friend when I was job hunting a couple of years ago, she asked like, well, what, what do you enjoy out of that job? And it really is just getting to know people. And also in some ways, 
building them up too with my with the segments I do on food which is it's just a weekly thing where I, I tell people stories but I love that I get to give people a platform in that way and then I love hearing from them later that the story I did they had the longest lines that they've ever had like you know it's just it's that to me like having some sort of impact and making sure too that it's a positive impact and I think that comes a lot with the anxiety is making sure okay you know not that everything I say has to be perfect, but that it has a really positive impact. So I think for me, it's just that drive to, to, to help in some way, to, in, in one way or the other. I don't want to like, I, I, I know that I'm like holding, like holding back, but it's like, I don't want to be like, oh, I'm, I'm helping people. But it's, I love when I get to give people a little something. I don't take it that way. And I think on your, um, which your bio, that you have a lot of history of really being giving and caring a lot and, and how you grew up, um, which I want people to read about, right? Because what I want to do at this time, if we can, first of all, I want to say if anybody, I'd like to see if Sandy would have put a link in the chat for Girls on the Run to make a donation. This is free, obviously. But if anybody feels so inspired that they appreciate Kylie coming, and it's certainly not mandatory, but if you want to give something to Girls on the Run, since Kylie loves that organization, we're inviting you here. I want Kylie to feel like that that's something that if that we can do for her. Um, if you're so moved, no pressure. Um, but also I want to ask Parker, if you have anything to say, and then I want to ask other people, what are you admiring? Or do you have any questions so that we can have a little bit of what we call in the Ignite Method a glow, which is we were, where we bask in the glow of the fire, bask in the glow of appreciating Kylie. Parker, what are you thinking? Um, hi, sorry, my apartment's a little noisy right now, but um, I just wanted to say I really resonated with the part about like the healing power of nature, because for me, I also deal with really bad anxiety, and I feel most calm when I'm at the, like in the ocean, like just with the water and stuff like that, so that's like one part that I really resonated with. Thank you, Parker, for weighing in. Parker is a freshman in college, and it's a busy time, and I'm so glad that you chimed in here. Thank you for also being honest. Where are you going to school, Parker? Um, I go to San Diego State. Oh, so you've got, like, the best ocean ever out there. That's amazing. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> She's got a lot going on right now. <laughs> so anybody else? want to comment right now on either what you admire about Kylie or ask a question. Who's going to go first? Besides Parker, which I appreciate. Well, this is Adrian. I'll go. Um, first of all, thank you, Kylie, for uh, just being authentic to you. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, my dear friend Seth, for this wonderful uh, session tonight. My question, I guess I have two questions, really. One is a weather question. I don't understand the dew point. Like when they talk about, you know, when it's really hot, and they talk about, or and they talk about the dew point. So that's one. That's more of a uh, logistic. But then, how long did did you go through counseling for a long period of time? Uh, and how, you know, because I've never gone through counseling. I just pray and ask God to help me. That's kind of what I do for the most part. Um, but um, so. Okay, I will start with the dew points. That, so dew points are so funny and people get so confused about them, which I totally get, but they're actually a better measure of humidity than like relative humidity is. And so I'm, I'm gonna like blink on the exact definition, but basically if the dew point is 50 and the temperature is 50, that means the air is saturated. So the closer that dew point is to that temperature, basically once that happens, it's a cloud. You get fog, you get rain, that's that moisture. It's just, that's completely, that's how much moisture is in the air and it gets saturated. And then at that point, it becomes some sort of condensation or uh, precipitation, whatever that may be. But specifically with the dew points, depending on where you live, it's just literally a measure of how much water is in the air. So here in Colorado, 30s, 40s, 50s for us would be a really humid day in the Midwest you get into the 60s and 70s. And okay. so it gets kind of confusing, but I would, when you hear it, the higher the number, the more humid it's going to be, if, if that makes sense. Interesting. That's, yeah, that's easy. I can remember that. You said the culture is to the temperature, 
the more humidity, and that's why it gets all muggy, and so I can get, and then kind of moist in the, yeah, okay. So like in the morning when I look for, if, to see if there's fog anywhere, I'll literally pull up the dew point and the temperature, and where they're the same, that's where there's fog. But then in the afternoon and evening, they typically aren't going to be like right next to the, like, it, it could be 100 degrees and the dew point could be in the 60s and that's still really humid. But yeah, in the morning we look at it for like fog and condensation and dew and whatnot, literally dew points. Uh, so yeah, that's that's how the dew point works, which that's yeah, it's, sometimes it's just easier to say it's really humid outside, but we'll put up like, I have specific graphics that show like, this is how sweaty you're gonna be depending on those dew points. So. I try and make it easier for people to understand, but I totally get it. Just locally in St. Louis right now, it's 81 degrees, 69 dew point. That's very humid. Is it humid? Yes. Yeah. It's a terrarium. It is, yeah. it's a terrarium. I mean, it is so humid. And I see calm back. It's humid. Yeah. I know Adrian had another question, but that's an incredible answer that's changed my life. <laughs> and it wasn't really helping me understand. Our humidity. Yeah was the same as California's. And yet it was so, you know, it felt so humid here. But yeah. the number of humidity was the same. It all has to do with how much moisture is in the air. Because the re like basically if someone tells you this is what the humidity is, they it's called the relative humidity. So it's relative to whatever that temperature is. Thank you. Whereas yeah. the point is like this is how much moisture is in the air. Like almost think about like a glass getting filled up. So okay. like that. Uh, and then for therapy, I started seeing my therapist in Minneapolis four years ago and I saw, or no, maybe three years ago. And I saw her for about six months until I moved. And I, with her, I developed these incredible coping skills that were super, super helpful. And then I moved and I was like, oh, I got this now. And probably eight months later here in Colorado, the anxiety comes back. And just like any kind of skill, you have to practice those skills or you lose that. Um, and so I ended up, I've been back in therapy for about a year and a half now. And I know everyone's different. I really like therapy. I, I am a little bit more hesitant to get on medication because I like cognitive behavioral therapy and the way that it works. But I think that in some ways, my therapist works in a lot of ways like people's religious leaders do. They offer that kind of thoughtful advice and thinking. And for me in particular, uh, my brain typically is wired to go down the bad rabbit hole mm -hmm. and say, okay, the bad thing's going to happen. And that, and then I'll sit there and I'll think about it. I'll think about it. I'll think about it. And so my therapist really helps me to think, okay, what if you looked at it from this perspective? And generally it's more positive. It's trying to find something. And so it's little pieces like that, that is almost rewiring my brain in some ways, just like medication would. It's just, I'm putting in that work. And if any of you guys are interested in finding a therapist. I highly, highly recommend it. I will probably go to one, even if it's just once every few months for the rest of my life, just kind of have that person to check in with. Uh, I went found my best therapist from psychologytoday.com. And oh. you literally, you can put in your insurance, you can read their, their bios because sometimes you get someone and it's just not a good fit. Like for me, for example, I really, um, I want my therapist to be a woman. I don't really want a man. I want them to kind of have like just a similar frame of mind. And so it was really nice to read their bio. So psychologytoday.com is where you find. Thank you. Where I found all my best therapists. I love that. That is so helpful. And Kylie has told me that she's actually gotten so many people that she knows to go to therapy. I'm how. I'm that person. I'm that friend that's like, I love you and I'll listen to you whenever you need. But let's get you in some therapy. Because <laughs> it's just, we, all need it. we all need a little extra support. And we need support too. I think that isn't supposed to be our friend like you know she's not like I trust her to not just be like oh no no no, you're good you're good she'd be like okay well how can we do this differently now that is a great friend to be it's a great friend you'll listen and you want to help get a great resource for the person point them in the right direction now we have a different kind of question okay um Ruich said my favorite chef on the planet is David Welch in Frisco do you know it don't know him. I, I've gotten to know a lot of the chefs and I only did the segment for about, I guess it's been a year now, but only six months before COVID when I actually meet them. So I've, lot, I've met a lot of the Denver chefs. I've not met a lot outside, but is, is he at like a specific restaurant? Because now I really want to go try it. I love it. Yeah, well, he's, he's a caterer now, um, oh. but it's a really incredible story. He grew up in uh, Summit County. So he's a local in Summit County. 
and he got a job as a teenager as a dishwasher at the lodge at Keystone. And then he rose th through the ranks and became eventually the executive chef and um, led that kitchen to four star, five star, whatever status. He, he became one of the most prominent chefs in, in Colorado. And then he burnt out. Um, and as he tells the story, he um, got tired of being stressed out all the time, dishing out food yeah. that the people he grew up with couldn't afford to buy. And so he quit the job. And then um, in a little spot over um, in, in the strip mall, at, at Frisco where the Walmart is and you know right there off of I-70 um, he opened a little storefront and all it was was a cash register and you would walk up and order the food at the cash register and then he and one other guy would they had he sourced the food from the same place so it was all the same great quality food that he was dishing out up the mountain but um, he was serving it at about half the price, really casual, about 10 minutes down the road from, uh, from Keystone. So you could go have these five-star meals for 20 bucks. Oh my God, and, so but then he got tired of doing that and he turned it into a catering business. It's called, um, it's called Food Heads, H-E-D-Z. Uh, cool, Food I'll have to check that out. Foodheads.com, it's awesome. Um, um, and he's a really good guy. That's so. cool. Tom, great. Yeah. You know your food too. Tom, <laughs> you know you do. So um, I just see here that Christine wrote, my daughters suffer from anxiety. I wish they were listening. We'll have a podcast. Your confidence and polish, I'm sure will help others realize they too can work through their anxious moments. Oh gosh, thank you, Christine. Amy says, powerful to have the smart as a whip woman be so honest. Thank you, Kylie. So I would like everybody here to think about one word that you admire in Kylie. I know I'm beating that Tom Tom, but um, actually, I just want you to think of one word right now that you admire in Kylie. Text it in or hold on to it in your head. Um, and let me just, I'm gonna look to see if anybody writes a couple of examples. Um, brave, that's a good word. That's a word that means something to you, Kylie, I think open um let's see if anything else comes in brave i know if you follow her blog you'll see brave i love that on the caption on one of the photos but i want authentic great word for kylie um i want to ask everybody so remember the old thing you spot it you got it and it's when you see something negative in somebody that they say you possess that it's a crushing blow it's like, wait, I can't. That's so unattractive. I possess it. It's like, yes, you do. You spot it. You got it. Well, the same is true with admiration. What you admire, you actually possess, even if it's just a little glimmer. So I want everyone to think of something that Kylie's inspired in you so that we all leave this with a, a little bit of something that we can take away for ourselves. We can appreciate Kylie and give, and they said Kylie connects. It's her, one of her superpowers, right? Is connect with anyone and everyone. She couldn't not connect. I don't, I can't imagine where Carol, except she said she didn't love delivering bad news, but I think she could have worked, you know. But think about that one thing you admire and what it is the takeaway is for yourself. And I just really want to thank you, Kylie, mm -hmm. for taking your time and for sharing who you are with us and your story and just bringing your magnificent magnetic presence to this group. Um, somebody said, I'm inspired to volunteer with young girls in the community. I love that. It, it's really fun. Young girls, it's just like, you know, it's almost like a, a blank canvas. You're just like, you're going to do something really amazing.